if you don't know what to pray for, just sing the ABC song and God will put the words together. So, little tip for the day. I invite you to look at the message insert in your order of service. Take notes on this morning's message. We will be singing parts of Joy to the World this morning. He was one of the most prolific hymn writers in history, yet in his day he was considered a heretic, a revolutionary. In his day, singing and worship was you took verses from the Bible and then you just sang them. The problem was the, wasn't the Bible, it was that the music that went with the words wasn't very good. He was 15 years old, and after one Sunday in worship, he just complained about how atrocious the, the singing was, the music was. And a church leader kind of called him out on and said, well, young man, you write something better. And that's what he did. He became a prolific hymn writer. He's known as the father of English hymnody. His name is Isaac Watts, and he wrote a number of songs. When I Survey the Wondrous Cross... And one we best know is Joy to the World. Why do I bring that up? Well, I was reading Psalm 98, which we're going to look at this morning, and as I was reading, I kept thinking of Joy to the World. And so I decided to look up the story for that hymn, and it turns out that Isaac Watts based Joy to the World on Psalm 98. When he wrote hymns, his goal was to reflect and exalt Jesus, and especially what Jesus had done for us on the cross. When you read Psalm 98, you discover that the psalmist's goal, we don't know his name, but his goal was to, to raise God up for people, not just in Israel, but around the world to express joy to this awesome God that we have. Oh, look what the psalmist writes here in verses 7 and 8. Let the earth resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains sing together for joy. Today, as we worship with joy, let's go to our great God in prayer. Holy Spirit, thank you for filling our hearts with joy. As we dig into Psalm 98 today, help us to sense your presence and live out your joy. As we worship you today, O God, let us celebrate you together with great joy. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for your coming into this world the first time at Christmas. We praise you for your coming again one day. Come and make us aware of your presence today. In your name, Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. Billy Graham made this observation. He said, we have confused happiness with joy. Sometimes there's an overlap, but sometimes we get confused because happiness is typically based on, on a circumstance or something that happens or, or a, a feeling of pleasure. But joy is much deeper than that. Happiness tends to be on what's on the outside, and, and joy is about what's happening on the inside. Well, life can be falling apart, and yet some people can grow deeper in their joy as they lean into who God is and what God has done for their life. When Isaac Watts wrote Joy to the World, his goal was to, to reflect that joy. Now, I know we, we, we sing this as a Christmas carol. Odds are we're going to sing it Christmas Eve. I would be shocked if we don't. But when he wrote it, that wasn't his goal. Think about the song. We're going to sing all four verses this morning. There's no angels mentioned. There's no manger. There's no Joseph or Mary. There's no Bethlehem mentioned. When he wrote the song, his goal was to take Psalm 98, reflect Jesus in it, and then talk about when Jesus was coming again. He looks back to when Jesus came. He looks forward to Jesus' presence with us today. And he looks ahead to that day when, when Jesus will come back. When Psalm 98 is written, it's written about God, about God in that day, what God had done in the past, and that God is coming again to, to judge in the future. As a church that believes in worship, we celebrate God together. Joy to the World is a great hymn to sing. And so this morning, we're going to sing all four verses at different times, and we're going to look at kind of responses to God's Word based on what Psalm 98 says. My goal is that when you walk out of here, you not only know joy of the world, but even more that you and I experience and understand what happens when we worship together. Why do we do what we do on a, a Sunday morning? The responses we look at are at the heart of worship, they're at the heart of the hymn, Joy to the World, and the heart of Psalm 98. Would you join me in singing verse 1? 
Kathy will be leading our singing. You can turn my mic down for this verse there, Craig. And let's enjoy the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven. The, the joy that comes to our world is so great, not only people sing of that joy, but also heaven and nature. The psalmist wants us to experience such joy. Look how he begins his psalm in verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Such words for the psalmist might refer back to the Exodus. That's when Moses leads the people of Israel out of Egypt. They've been in slavery for hundreds of years. And God works through Moses to lead them out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. It might refer back to that, that time when the Jews had been taken off into exile in Babylon. And God now is inviting people to come back to Jerusalem. That, that, that brings joy to this writer. When I think of that phrase of a, a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, I, I think of Jesus extended on the cross. I, I think of his arms extended for you and for me to, to pay the price for our sins. Well, what's unique in, in the way that the psalmist writes and Isaac Watts kind of puts that first verse is, typically when we speak of salvation, we talk only of what it means for me, what it means that I am saved. But the psalmist and Isaac Watts tells it from the other point of view. They, they write about God working out our salvation. Not just what's in it for me, but how awesome is a God who loves us so much that he would save us. And he would save slaves in Egypt and bring them to freedom in Israel. That he would bring exiles back to Babylon, from Babylon to Jerusalem. That Jesus would die for, for you and for me. That, that we might have life with God. That God's love and God's salvation is so great. And he wants that indeed for, for all the world. For, for you and for me. Look at what it says here in, in verse 6. Shout for joy before the Lord. And then notice the next two words. The King. Here the psalmist leads us to the first response of worship. When you worship, you receive God as king. That means I'm off the throne, you're off the throne, God is on the throne. In the Bible, we read the king's agenda. We read his platform. We read what he stands for. Uh, th think of it this way. The difference between a, a, a brick and a Bible. The, a brick, uh, like a brick wall or, or a house, can, can, can last for quite some time. Hundreds of years, perhaps. Paper that doesn't last that long. You might guard a book, you might protect a book, but over time it will deteriorate. And yet, did you listen to what Jesus said earlier? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. God's word gets passed from generation to generation to generation. The story of who Jesus is the greatness of God's love, his work in the past and what it means for life in the present and the impact it has on our future. That God speaks into your life and into my life of, of the great work that he does. That God is our king and our king forever. That leads Isaac Watts to continue. Uh, join in singing verse 2. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let all their songs imply. While fields and clods, rocks, hills and plains, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy. 
fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains. The list could go on. All of creation joins to praise God because God is our king. The psalmist expands the idea of singing together for joy beyond those gathered in the temple in Jerusalem to worship. Look at it right here in verse 2. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. God's righteousness is not only the price that Jesus paid for us that, that we might be his. God's righteousness is following the right way to live. And so when you and I gather for worship, the second response is this. When you worship, you recommit to God's reign. You recommit to God's agenda. An old poem by Lewis Blanchard Eads asks this question. If Jesus came to your house, just imagine what your response might be. What, what if you knew that, that Jesus was coming to your house tonight for dinner? Might, might your life be a little different this afternoon? Might, might there be some things in the house that you make sure are out of the house before Jesus gets there? Might your TV watching habits change? Your conversations with, with each other? And if Jesus came and Jesus said he wanted to stay for a while, are you okay with that? Or would you hope he's like, you know, three days and you're out? And yet Jesus is with us. That, that's the beauty of who Jesus is. That's the beauty of, of life with God. In the Bible, God tells us the great story of salvation, that Jesus is our king. And in the Bible, God reveals the king's agenda, the king's platform. In some ways, that's the purpose of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are more than a list of, of do's and do nots. It really describes what life would be like if we put God as king in life and, and followed his wisdom and guidance. Think of it this way. Just, just think through the Ten Commandments. So, uh, what would life be like if everyone had God as number one in their life? If they always did what God wanted to have done? How might the use of God's name be different in our world? Instead of a swear word, it was used as a form of worship to speak of the awesome God that he is. What might life be like if, if we did take time to rest on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, to lift up his name? How would life be different if, if in families that parents were honored and in society authority was honored and respected what would life be like if all life was valued? From conception to the grave. How might marriage be different if, if intimacy was protected? And faithfulness and love ruled the day? Or if you didn't have to worry about your possessions being taken, they were valued. Or if the words that were always spoken were, were trustworthy and, and encouraging. If we found contentment in our relationships with people and with the stuff that we already have. I know. Not, sounds pretty ideal, doesn't it? That doesn't seem to describe life in our day, but yet that, that's the king's agenda. Now, now, the Ten Commandments in our day serve another purpose. They, they, they show us our sin and the need for a Savior. You might be thinking, well, I haven't killed anybody. I'm good on that one. Okay, J Jesus lifts it up a notch in, in the Gospel accounts. J Jesus says, if you've hated your brother in your heart, you have sinned. I confess, that would be me. The Ten Commandments show us our need for a Savior, but they also show us the, the right way to live. And they invite us to come to this great God and, and His work in our life and what He desires to do. And 
Yet in our world, we recognize that, that sin and sorrow are present. And so Isaac Watt continues here. Let's join in singing uh, verse 3. At Jesus' first coming at Christmas, that, that, that's kind of the dream. No more sin, no more sorrow. When he comes back, that, that's the reality. No more sin, no more sorrow. But it hasn't happened yet. But it will one day. Oh, look what the psalmist says here in verse 9. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity. Our world's not sin-free. It's not sorrow-free. But one day it will be. That leads to the third response in worship. <coughs> when you worship, you reconcile to God. You get right with Him. You experience forgiveness. And a few moments in our worship service, typically on a weekly basis, we, we take a time to confess our sins to God and to hear a word of forgiveness because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Confession means to say the same after. It's basically to, to say, God, I, I have sinned. I recognize that sin. I, I confess it to you. Now, here's the deal. God, God doesn't need that. God knows your sins and my sins better than we do, better than your family does even. God knows, and he invites us to confess, not, not for his benefit, but for our benefit, to clear our conscience, to, to receive the forgiveness that he gives. When you, when you think of the, the judge image that's used here in the Psalms, with the, with the judge image, there, there's this idea that I come before the court and I say, I, I am guilty as charged. I throw myself on on the mercy of God's court. And the message we hear is, is that there is one who has paid the price for us. There is one who has died for us. There is one who, who, who gives us life. And that comes through him. That forgiveness and life with God lead Isaac Watts to sing a fourth verse. We join in singing verse 4. Such wonders lead the psalmist to say in verse 3. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. That hasn't happened yet. But we pray one day it will. And all the ends of the earth will, will see the salvation of God. That leads to a fourth response when we gather to worship. When you worship, you remember God's gift of salvation. You remember what God has done for us. A couple times in the, in the past year, people have come up to me, and, and there's people who are family or friends who are, are near death. And, and their observation is this. They go, my, my relative, my friend, has, has always believed in Jesus, but for whatever reason, 
they, they seem to be doubting their salvation at this point. They, they're, they're afraid of what might happen next. They're wondering, am I saved? Now, if you and I were to, to sit down and have a conversation, and that were your question, am I saved? How, how can I know I'm saved? I, I, I would say, the, the Bible tells us this incredible story of God's great love for you and for me. That though we sinned and rebelled against God, God sent His Son Jesus, who came in a manger, who lived a perfect life and died on a cross and rose from the dead. Even more so, what's amazing about the story when you think about this, J Jesus called it. Three times in the Gospel accounts, it, it talks about how Jesus told His followers, look, we're, we're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'll be arrested. I'll be killed. And the third day, I'll rise from the dead. Now, the first three, you, you could kind of, you know, arrange to happen to, to kind of have a self-fulfilling prophecy. But when you call your resurrection, that's pretty impressive. And that's what Jesus did. He paid the price for our sins. He paid it all. And he gives us life. And the question is, do, do you believe that? That Jesus paid it all? And if you do, the Bible describes that as receiving the gift of salvation. Now, you, you might feel that. You might not feel that. It's not based on our feeling. Where I think doubt kind of creeps in a little bit, we, we think it's something we have to do. Have I been good enough? Have I done enough? Have I loved enough? Okay, not to hurt your feelings. We can't do enough. We can't love enough. But he can. And even better, he did. It's not based on what we do. It's based on what he's done. Our life is a life of response and gratitude to this great gift of God because Jesus paid it all. In baptism, we, we receive the gift of what Jesus did and are welcomed into the family. In confirmation, we, we affirm this great gift and say, this is the life I want this is the life God has given me. And when we worship, we remember the story. We tell it over and over and over again. Because it's the foundation of life. That life comes as God's gift, whether it's your physical life or your spiritual life. Life is a gift from God. 22 days after you were conceived, a tiny little electrical pulse stimulated the heart muscle of your left and right atria to contract. It's called an atrial kick. It forced blood into your ventricles. The beat was so faint it, it cannot be detected, even with amplification. But it was the first beat of your heart only 22 days after you were conceived. And it's never stopped. Just make it sure. Never stopped from this day until now. 70 milliliters of blood with every contraction. That's 14,000 pints of blood flowing through your body a day. Not, some of it recycles, not, you know, making round trips. 100,000 heartbeats a day. Now, I'm just curious. Anybody, like, ever forgot where you left your keys or your kids? Or you walked into a room and you can't remember why you walked in there? Here's the deal. If we're so absent-minded, how many of us would still be alive if we had to remember to tell our heart to beat constantly through the day? And so God made you and me with hearts that beat and started 22 days after you were conceived and still beating today even greater than the physical heart that God has given you and me is, is the spiritual heart. God gave us a spiritual heart that we might be connected with Him. It's the source of your will. It's why you do what you do. 
It's the part of you that lives on forever. And God desires that that would be connected with him now and through all eternity. It's why we sing joy to the world. It's why we sing together for joy. Your spiritual heart, the core of you that goes on forever, that's what resonates in worship. When you worship, you receive God as king. When you worship, you recommit to God's reign. When you worship, you reconcile to God. When you worship, you remember God's gift of salvation. But most of all, when you worship, you reveal your spiritual heart. You reveal what ultimately matters. You, you realign to God who made you, who died for you, and gives you life each day. Let's go to that great God in prayer. Gracious God, thank you for bringing us together to worship you today. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of salvation you give and the Holy Spirit brings into our hearts and lives. As we worship you today and every day, may our hearts reveal that we receive you as king and to your reign in our lives. Forgive our sins and reconcile us to you. Let us always remember your great gift of salvation and share that good news with others. We praise you for the saving God you are. We praise you with all creation with great joy. And all God's people said, Amen.